Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Don't forget, I have several other podcasts out there, from John to Justin, Coast to Coast, Canada's Great War, and Pucks and Cups, and they're available on all podcast platforms. I do all these podcasts full-time, the writing, the research, everything. So every dollar you give keeps it all going, and I'll make sure I thank you on the air and throughout my social media. If you like, you can email me at craig at CanadaEHX.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok at Baird037, where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. You can also go to my YouTube page, where I put up weekly videos about Canada's history. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. All these links are in my show notes. And finally, if you want to find various articles, 700 in total, about Canada's history, as well as transcripts of every episode, just go to CanadaEHX.com. The site that would one day be Athabasca sits on the land that was traditionally occupied by the Cree people. In fact, the name itself comes from the Cree. There are two main interpretations of the name and its origin. The first is that it comes from the word of Arabasca, which was recorded by Peter Pond when he came through the area. The other is that it comes from the word Athabascao, and one interpretation of the name meaning where there are reeds, and another states meaning is meeting place of many waters. Wherever the name comes from, the Cree were the traditional occupiers of the land long before Europeans started to arrive. Eventually, as fur traders came to the area, the culture and trading economy of the indigenous would change forever. Today, the area sits in the land under Treaty 6 signed in 1876, but also Treaty 8 signed in 1899. The founding of Athabasca owes itself to a trail and the desire of the Hudson's Bay Company to seek an alternative route to Fort Assiniboine in the 1870s. For centuries, the indigenous people used various routes between the North Saskatchewan River and the Athabasca River. Due to the fact that the Athabasca eventually joined the Mackenzie River and drained into the Arctic Ocean, it made it very important for the fur trade. A pack trail was eventually created that ran from Fort Edmonton to Fort Assiniboine, well to the north of future Athabasca Landing Trail. That trail would be used from 1824 to 1876, but the Hudson's Bay Company wanted an alternative trail, and that led to the creation of the Athabasca Landing Trail and the founding of Athabasca in 1876. The trail would become extremely important to the early history of the area, and it is the reason Athabasca exists today. In 2010, a master plan for a modern version of the Athabasca Landing Trail was completed. This 150km non-motorized trail would run from Fort Saskatchewan to Athabasca, and highlight the history and natural features of the area. It's also planned to be part of the Trans-Canada Trail. In the summer of 1892, the Northwest Mounted Police stationed officers in the area due to increased traffic along the trail, and a permanent post was built in 1893 where Inspector D.M. Howard and eight constables were stationed. Unfortunately, one constable would die suddenly in May of 1893, necessitating a replacement to be sent out immediately. The post was typically referred to as the Last Point North. The town name would originally be Athabasca Landing when the town first came into being in the late 1890s. That name would change to Athabasca with a K in 1904 and would remain as that name until 1948 when it was changed to the current spelling of Athabasca with a C. When the Klondike Gold Rush kicked off in 1897, it spelled a boom time for Athabasca. As a major stopping point along the all-Canadian route, many prospectors began to come to the area looking to continue along their trail. With an influx of prospectors, a need for some ships on the Athabasca River became apparent. By the early 1900s, the gold rush was over, but that didn't stop Peace River Jim Cornwall from starting the Northern Transportation Company. Providing a fleet of ships up to Fort McMurray, Cornwall added in a steamboat that would compete with the Hudson's Bay Company. He had a 10-ton boiler transported up from Edmonton in 1905 to be used in his new ship. Christened as the Midnight Sun, it made voyages on an irregular basis to Grand Rapids where it would meet with other ships. It also travelled up the stream to Mirror's Landing to provide service. In order to meet the growing demand for freight and passenger transport, the Northern Transportation Company brought in a sidewheel steamer into the fleet. It was called the Northland Echo, and this ship would transport passengers and freight all the way up into the Peace River area. In 1912, the Canadian Northern Railway Station was built in Athabasca, 
which was served by the Edmonton and Slave Lake Railway previously, and then the Canadian Northern Railway by the time the station was built. The station was larger than most in the area, showing the importance the railway put on Athabasca as a major stop along the railway. Similar stations, built slightly larger, were built in Big River, Stettler, and Hanna, which were all divisional points. The Athabasca Rail Station did not have a specialized passenger waiting area or dining room, and it had a smaller baggage storage capacity. And while the use of train service has drastically decreased throughout the area, the Athabasca train station still stands to this day and is currently being restored to its former glory by the Athabasca Heritage Society. One year after the train station was built and Athabasca was enjoying an influx of settlers, the Athabasca Methodist Church was built. When it was built, it was one of the largest frame structures in Alberta, capable of housing more than 600 people. It was built at a time when Athabasca was booming, and there was a belief that Athabasca would continue to see its population soar. The plan of the church featured many windows and a square design to give an atmosphere of grandeur with the preacher at the center. The church, now called the Athabasca United Church, still stands to this day in the community. In 1985, it was made a provincial historic resource. Unfortunately, the major rail lines bypassed Athabasca, and any hopes of the settlement becoming a major center were dashed. By 1914, the boom for Athabasca Landing had turned into a bust, and businesses were pulling out of the area. The Northern Transportation Company was no different, and Jim Cornwall decided to get out of the area. He made the decision to run the Midnight Sun from Grand Rapids to Fort McMurray, something many believed was impossible. To accomplish this, he reinforced a 13-foot hull of the Midnight Sun and put together a crew of settlers and local indigenous people. As the ship entered the rapids, it was pulled towards a precipice, but with Cornwall screaming the crew on, the ship made it through and reached Fort McMurray. When it reached the community, it was renamed the Northland Echo and spent the rest of its days running from Fort McMurray to Fitzgerald. Seeing that the Midnight Sun had reached Fort McMurray from Athabasca Landing, the Hudson's Bay Company decided to try the same thing. They ran their steamer, the Athabasca River, over the rapids and to Fort McMurray as well, and it spent the rest of its days hauling freight on Lake Athabasca. Online security is something I know a bit about. Before I was a podcaster, or even a journalist, I was a network administrator. Keeping computers secure at my work was paramount to what I did, and it was very difficult to do 15 years ago. But now, a company like NordVPN makes it much easier to stay safe online and not be exploited by hackers. NordVPN allows you to change your IP address, which makes you harder to track, and that secures your privacy online. Their software is easy to set up and easy to use. With it, you are one click away from security online and protecting yourself from those who want your information for nefarious purposes. For all of my listeners, NordVPN is offering a discount on their service. Just go to nordvpn.com EHX and enter in the offer code of EHX to take advantage of the savings. You can also click the link in my show notes. Your internet security is only one click away through a reliable company like NordVPN. The early 20th century was a time of great movements of humanity to and through North America. When an image of new settlers coming to the prairies comes up, it tends to be of Europeans leaving their homelands to the wide open areas of Alberta and Saskatchewan. But there was another wave of immigration through, and it came from the deep south of America, and it was black immigration to Canada. At the time in the American South, Jim Crow laws were being implemented that enforced racial segregation against black people. And it would come as no surprise then that in the space of only two years with Canada's immigration system opening up, there would be a large black migration from the American South to the Canadian prairies. Between 1909 and 1911, 1,000 African Americans came to Alberta, settling in many different areas and forming communities. Amber Valley, just to the west of Athabasca, was one of those places. In 1909, a group of 160 African-American homesteaders left Oklahoma and Texas for the government promise of land to homestead. Leaving the racist conditions that caused extreme discrimination of their rights, the settlers hoped to find something better in Alberta, and they would found several communities. The group of settlers to settle in Amber Valley were led by Parson Harrison Sneed, a clergyman and mason, as well as Willis Reese Bowen, who organized the original five families to settle in the area. Sneed had come to the land north of Edmonton to scout it out, and when the group made their way to Canada, the Northern News reported the following, quote, A bunch of colored folk accompanied their families and household goods came in from Edmonton last week. We understand it is their intention to locate somewhere in the vicinity, end quote. While the doors opened for black settlers under the immigration campaign of Clifford Sifton, the Minister of the Interior, to bring more settlers to the area, Sifton was not happy with African Americans coming to Canada. He wanted European immigrants for the most part, 
He then sent a letter to the immigration officials in the American South to have them dissuade black farmers from coming to Canada. He would also implement clearly racist policies that created barriers to immigration, which made it more difficult for black immigrants to come to Canada. These policies included putting out warnings such as this one, quote, The American Negro may be barred on the grounds that he could not adapt to the rigorous northern climate. End quote. A black medical doctor from Chicago was hired by the Canadian government to go to Oklahoma and speak about how those who immigrated to Canada would starve or freeze to death and the soil was poor. These policies would remain in place until 1962 when they were overturned with the help of Violet King Henry, whose parents had settled in Amber Valley. At first, living in the area was difficult and the harsh winter weather of Alberta was not an easy adjustment for the settlers from Oklahoma. In addition to the harsh weather, the settlers had to clear and cultivate the land and build houses from the ground up. Typically, these were log cabins and the land was mostly muskeg and had to be ready for crops. Most of the settlers had to wait two years before they could harvest their first crops. In addition, they had to cut their own road to the community. The settlers were tough and worked hard on the land and 75% stayed in the area and farmed there long enough in order to secure their homestead patents. The percentage of black settlers who remained on the land long enough for the patent was higher than the percentage of other settler groups in the prairies. By the 1930s, Amber Valley had become the largest community of black people in Alberta, and it would receive a post office in 1931, and the name would change from Pine Creek to Amber Valley at that point. The name came at the suggestion of a local teacher who said Amber Valley matched the color of the land. At the time, 300 people lived in the community, and they even had a two-room schoolhouse for the large influx of children in the area. Racism was still seen in the area with racist slurs yelled when one of the black settlers was in a predominantly white community. Slurs and some discrimination was the extent of what the black settlers faced, with no threats on their life as was seen in the American South at the time. Nonetheless, the resistance to the settlers was extreme at times. The Edmonton Board of Trade would say of the influx, quote, Those Negroes who have been here for some time have had a square deal and been treated as whites, but if you get a few thousand more in, conditions would be much changed, end quote. The Board of Trade was one of the leaders of the opposition to black immigration and were able to attract 3,000 signatures on a petition opposing the immigration, despite Edmonton having a population of 25,000 at the time. The United Farmers of Alberta also had a similar racist view, saying, quote, We consider Negroes undesirable as fellow citizens of the province. End quote. That being said, there were some big differences between Oklahoma and Amber Valley. Jefferson Edwards told a story of being in a bar in Athabasca and staring down a fight with another person in the bar. Suddenly, francophones dropped what they were doing to defend Edwards. The Ukrainians of the area, who had dealt with discrimination of their own, would work together with the black community to improve both groups' lands. As the 1930s progressed and into the 1950s, the population of the community began to decline as more people moved to different areas of the province and into cities. There were still various improvements, though. In 1946, Key School was added onto the new school to form a new two-room school. By 1968, the post office had closed and the community would progress to the point of being a ghost town. The school would be demolished, but a replica would be built and currently sits at the Canadian Museum of History. While the community of Amber Valley no longer exists, the settlers and their descendants have improved Canada in many ways. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. On August 5, 1913, Athabasca would go through one of its darkest days when a massive fire tore through the community. 
It was in the middle of the night when the fire began from unknown origins and started to burn through the community. R.H. Campbell would say, quote, It has not been discovered where or how the fire started, but it was an aider in the Grand Union Hotel where I was staying, or in the building next door, or both simultaneously. End quote. Campbell was woken up at 1.40 a.m. by two men who were banging on doors and yelling fire. At first he thought it was just two drunks, but he soon realized the building was on fire. He would say, quote, The flames were just about at my door by that time. I got hurriedly into some clothes and collected my belongings and made my way out. End quote. At the time, there was little in the way of firefighting in the community, and most people were confused and unorganized in their response to the fire. No water system was in place, and the only way to fight the fire was with a bucket brigade. By the time the fire was out, the entire business section of the community was destroyed. In all, 32 businesses burned to the ground, but thankfully, no one was killed. The estimated damages were $500,000 or about $15 million today. Hundreds lost everything in the fire, and a relief train was sent from Edmonton carrying food supplies, tents, and bedding. Ike Gagnon was the person hit the worst by the fire. He owned a number of buildings, and it was estimated he lost $200,000 in the fire, and he had no insurance at the time. The immigration hall was opened, and services, including food and handing out of provisions and other items, was initiated. Guests who had been in the hotels were also able to stay there. The fire was not going to keep the town down, though. The Regina Leader Post reported, quote, Harvey Cull, druggist, whose entire stock was destroyed, will open Friday morning with brand new stock. This exemplifies the spirit of the men of Athabasca. A dozen new buildings are already being arranged for. End quote. Another story states that within two hours of the fire being subdued, the Royal Bank and the Bank of Commerce were unloading lumber at new locations, while a party of businessmen left for Edmonton to obtain new stock. In 1970, Athabasca University was created by the Alberta government in an attempt to expand higher education to cope with rising enrollment in the province. At the time, there was the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, and the University of Lethbridge. The government of the 1960s wanted a fourth public university, but this was delayed until the 1970s. Finally, Grant McEwen, the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, established Athabasca University through an order in council. The university was started as a pilot project to allow students to achieve their educational goals without leaving their homes, families, or jobs. As a result, Athabasca University became a distance learning centre. From 1972 to 1976, 650 students took part in the pilot project, and the first convocation ceremony was held in 1977. In 1978, the Alberta Universities Act was revised to grant the university self-governing status. And while the university was named for Athabasca, the main campus would not actually be relocated to Athabasca from Edmonton until 1984. Today, the campus remains there with satellite campuses in Calgary, Edmonton, and St. Albert. Today, the university has an enrollment of 40,000 students with a faculty and staff of 1,200. The university offers 900 courses and more than 50 undergraduate and graduate programs. Many notable people have also studied through Athabasca University, including Olympian Christian Farstad, former Premier Ralph Klein, and NHL player Aylan McCauley. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Athabasca. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D, Colin Johnson, Katie Caldwell, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W, Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseeth, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.